everyone. This is the uh, Public School Speakers Bureau, and I am Donna Mills, uh, Chairman of the Board. I am going to be interviewing a very special guest. I think that you're going to really enjoy uh, hearing some about his work, and uh, so we're going to go right into it. Now, before we introduce the guests, uh, for those of you that have not been on the Speakers Bureau uh, and have watched it before. We are here to motivate, inspire, and encourage both our students and our community. So at this time, I'm going to introduce Mr. Sean Reef. And Mr. Sean Reef is the director of Leap Lab Florida. Yes, ma'am. And so we welcome you to the program and thank you so much for coming out of your busy schedule to help us this well, today. Thank you so much for the invitation. Great, great. We're going to get right into it. And as I explained to you earlier, this is about your life story. Okay. And why you chose to go in the profession that you are in today. Mm -hmm. So can you start out with your childhood memories? What was child? What was your childhood like? Sure. Uh, I grew up in the New Orleans area. Mm -hmm. uh, we transitioned to the suburbs when uh, my dad, who's a physician, got his first job. We moved out to the suburb of Metairie, which was kind of a wilderness at that time. Mm -hmm. So I got to experience a lot more natural world than I had seen growing up in the city, which was fantastic for me. We were a, little, a block from Lake Pontchartrain, so I got to go fishing. I got to ride my bike mm -hmm. all over the, the world, it wow. seemed, mm -hmm. and explore things I didn't get a chance to see prior to that. As a kid? As a kid. As a seven, eight-year-old. Wow. And as you think about back, tho back as you think about those memories, mm -hmm. What type of feeling do you get? Was it something that you appreciated? Oh, absolutely, or? Mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, I, I like being in the city. You know, we were around all all of our relatives, my, my parents' okay. parents, you know, within blocks. Okay. You know, very much the New Orleans community thing. Okay. Uh, yet, there was a, a real feeling of uh, liberation and freedom when we got out to the, the undeveloped suburbs. This is early to mid-1970s I'm okay, talking about. Okay. And uh, the freedom that the bicycle gave me felt like it was unlimited. Mm -hmm. uh, that same time, right about that same time, I got my first trip to the beach mm -hmm. in Pensacola. Mm -hmm. And uh, to it, see... You uh, were how old? Seven. Okay. I was seven. Mm -hmm. And to see that endless horizon uh, and to see fish jumping, you know, some pretty big fish mm -hmm. uh, near the beach gave me a sense of the greater possibilities. Okay, how many siblings were in your family and did you grow up with both parents? I did. Mm -hmm. uh, they did get divorced uh, in my mid-teen years, uh, but I, I had three siblings mm -hmm. and uh, we, we're pretty close. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we lived in different parts of the world, mm -hmm. uh, but we were close then, we're, we're close now. Okay, um, during the divorce time, how did you take that? What, did, what went in your mind in regards to being, you know, having divorced parents? It, it was chaotic, uh, you know, to, to say the least. Uh, it was it was a, a rocky time, mm -hmm. uh, and my elder sister and myself took on some parental duties for the, the younger two siblings mm -hmm. uh, because the the parents were more interested in going at each other, I'm afraid, than mm -hmm. you know, uh, perhaps minding the shop at home. To be honest, so, yeah, but yeah, yeah, that, that kind yeah. of thing's not unheard of. No, that's what happens usually. Very yeah. seldom is it something a, a smooth process. No, this was not smooth. Right. But it was over in about two years. So. Okay. Now, um, you married? I am. Okay. Tell us about your. You know, how did y'all meet? Tina, I, I Tina? met Tina at a, uh, a fraternity rush party. Mm -hmm. that uh, I almost didn't go to. My roommate at the time had to pry me. For once, I was really committing to studying. It's my first year at Southeastern Louisiana University, mm -hmm. and I really, it was the early part of the semester. It was about this time of year. It was actually early September. Mm -hmm. I wanted to stay home and study. You know, the, the, the new classes that I had mm -hmm. just gotten. I was a new SLU student. He said, this is rush week. Come on, let's just go have a little bit of fun. You'll live. Mm -hmm. Come on out with me. So he had to pry me out of my room and away from my studies and at the first place we went to I saw this really attractive uh, Hispanic looking uh, young woman uh, who uh, I pursued down the, the driveway uh, and uh, started a, a, a dialogue and we've that dialogue has continued to this day that was uh, September of 1985. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> 
children? We have one uh, exceptional daughter. Ariane is uh, an LPA student. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she's my pride and joy. Uh, she's, uh, her life is full of extracurricular activities that uh, busy. keep us busy a little bit too. Uh, she's, uh, she's heavily involved in the dramatic arts. She has a beautiful voice. She just sang the national anthem again in, down in Palm Beach Gardens at Roger Dean Stadium. Uh, so she's, she's doing fantastically well. So she's our, our slightly spoiled only child. So, Sean, tell us about your daughter, Ariane, some more. Is she um, performing locally? Uh, she's at the Pineapple Playhouse. She's performed there uh -huh. uh, in some local uh, theater productions. Okay. Uh, she's not yet singing locally, but that's likely to change, I think, this over the course of this year. Okay. Uh, she takes regular vocal lessons on the weekends. And I Vera. would love to hear her personally. She has a beautiful voice, and I, I'm nowhere near being objective, but it's, it's moving to me to hear her sing. She's very composed to be able to get out in front of uh, uh, even a, a lightly attended baseball game mm -hmm. at a you know a local uh, baseball event mm -hmm. it takes a lot of composure. Mm -hmm. uh, the anthem is not the easy song no, to sing. No, it's not. No, I'm There's a singer myself, and I know it's not easy to sing. No, you know, and hit no. those notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when she does "Over the Rainbow," oh wow, it's beautiful. She's, huh? Yeah, she's got. Oh. She's always on key, and she's got a sense of melody to her okay. voice. Well, I'll definitely keep that in mind, and, and if we ever need her, you know, to sing, uh, hopefully she'll accept our invite. I believe she would. Great, great. Um, so you sound very proud of her, your only one. That's right. Uh-huh. And so that was one of my questions, but I guess the question, my next question is, what do you feel most proud of? Let's, let's phrase it like Personal that. Personal accomplishment. Okay. Um, Going back and getting my master's degree was uh, a difficult thing to do while mm -hmm. working full time mm -hmm. as a USDA scientist. Tell us tech. about that. Tell us more about your educational background. Sure. Well, I got my. Uh, I started out in the sciences. I went. I attended. I discovered the East Coast of Florida when I transitioned from UC Santa Barbara mm -hmm. in '88 to Florida Tech in '89. So, a 3,200 mile move. Mm -hmm. uh, I attended. Uh, I got my core scientific uh, classwork done at Florida Tech, ran into some financial difficulties. Mm -hmm. It's a private school. Mm. It's not a, a terribly expensive one, at least back then. So I ended up going back to the University of New Orleans uh, and going back to the New Orleans area and finishing with a BA in history, which I loved. Okay. Uh, it, it is my first academic love, mm -hmm. the, the subject. History, okay. It is. And uh, UNO had a terrific um, selection of history professors at the time. Mm -hmm. Stephen Ambrose was still a professor there, Band of Brothers fame. Okay. I had a, a class with him, uh, but I would have to say that there were other sci that there were other history professors who were at least as good. Joseph Logston, mm -hmm. the uh, the gentleman who brought 12 Years a Slave back into the public awareness. Okay. He was a, he's a UNO professor. Wow. Uh, he did, really? that okay. did that in 1968, which mm -hmm. took some courage mm -hmm. to do in the South yeah. at that time. Yes. Uh, he was still there, great professor. He was one of many. Richard Collins, mm -hmm. uh, influential in my understanding of modern American history. Okay. They've all since retired, mm -hmm. and unfortunately most of them are no longer with us. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering why you didn't come to us and become a history teacher. <laughs> I thought about it. You thought about it. <laughs> I thought okay. about it. But you ended up going into a different career. Yes. So Can I ended talk up... talk to us about that? Later? Right. I, uh, I went, I was a science tech at at USGA and liked what I was doing, but I felt like I was in a pretty narrow silo, pretty narrow lane, mm -hmm. and wanted to do something that would allow me to address the concerns that I had about the environmental um, issues that we collectively are all having as a society. I mean, it, this, is a, this is a global thing. Mm -hmm. So I found a degree program at Virginia Tech. Uh, it was an intensive program that condensed two years of coursework into one. The, the work was turned in online, but you actually had to attend class every month mm -hmm. in Arlington. Okay. So I had to fly to D.C. Wow. every month with mm -hmm. all my work done. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a super intense year. Sounds like it. And then we had an externship where we went to India. Mm -hmm. And uh, through a, a USDA connection I made, um, I was actually able to go to India eight days prior to the classes eight days in mm -hmm. India. So I had a two and a half week immersive experience in southern and central and western India. 
Okay. So we, we went to Karnataka, a southern state. I went to some tiger preserves. Wow, you've been all over. Uh, I, I, yeah. I packed as much into those 16 and a half days as I could. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Delhi is a, an experience unto itself. Mm -hmm. 27 million people. takes and, half an hour to fly across. And, wow. And that led you to what you do today? It did. Okay, it talk did. to us a little bit about that, because you've got something on the table sure. that I'm sure the children yeah. would love I'm, to I'm, hear what I think it's all so. about. There was an event prior to that. My partner, Dr. Marcus Erickson, who is uh, a guy I served in the Marines with, he's since gotten his PhD, he invited me. Uh, he went west, and I ended up going east. He lived in, still lives in California. He invited me to go on a a, uh, a voyage to uh, document plastics in the ocean uh, mm -hmm. on a triple-masted schooner in 2015, leaving from south of Luthra, going to Bermuda, okay. a five-day sail. Mm -hmm. And experiencing that, seeing how the plastic density was certainly and obviously increasing as we got towards this, the North Atlantic gyre, mm -hmm. uh, just north of Bermuda, really gave me pause. Uh, it, it, it again gave me a sense of broader possibilities and the fact that I, I need to reshift my thinking. Maybe I'm, I'm a little comfortable in my science tech position, kind of cloistered away out at Pico's farm, again, which I liked. Uh, that's what led me to the Virginia Tech program. The Virginia Tech program led us to form Leap Lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, Leap Lab was initiated in 2020. We've been operating in St. Lucie County. Uh, I've been building relationships. Since 2020? Since, since 2020. Okay, now hold, pause right there. Sure. Tell us how long have you lived in St. Lucie County? 99, uh, June of 99, okay. we bought our house. Okay. So I'm a 23-year resident of St. Lucie County. Okay, okay, continue on with... I've lived here more than anywhere else mm -hmm. uh, through, through so the course of my life. continue on with... with Leap Lab and how you sure. you know got involved and and what exactly it does yep. and show us we have we we've, we've got to we've got to hear about this <laughs> that's on the table yeah. we only have so many minutes sure. so yeah well in 2018 Marcus invited me to go to one of his paleo expeditions in eastern Wyoming and we knocked around the base notions behind Leap Lab uh, I was still in grad school I was my life was very hectic at the time. So I didn't, I was really focused on completing that. Mm -hmm. But I participated in uh, a dinosaur dig for the first time. We worked on a, a pelvis of a triceratops mm -hmm. that was about 95% intact. Uh, that was enormous uh, as a result of it being intact. And mm -hmm. we did not finish that extraction that year. That was finished a year or two after that. And so you, you, you mentioned the type of dinosaur. Yeah that you guys had actually found, or what do you... Right, it's, yeah. uh, the, the amazing thing about this area is it was part of the old, in the late Cretaceous, this was part, the east, the, the western shore of, I'm sorry, the eastern shore of the western inland seaway, which was a, a body of salt water that doesn't exist anymore that ran from the Gulf of Mexico up to the east side of Alaska. Oh. So the central part of the United States was underwater was essentially an extension of the Gulf of Mexico. So it was a shallow body of water. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an incredibly fossil rich area now. Uh, at, at this point, the eastern high plains are 4,500 feet above sea level. Mm -hmm. uh, so the earth has changed tremendously. Uh, and yet at that time, that area looked much like uh, Florida does now. There were a lot of palms. There were a lot of cycads mm -hmm. um, prior to the the extinction event that uh -huh. ended the dinosaurs. Uh -huh. uh, so the, the, the fossils are plentiful. Okay. There's uh, the, the dig site nearest our campsite is about a thousand meters away uh -huh. and we've produced, it, it's yielded 35 plus fossils and counting. Uh -huh. We find stuff there every year. Uh -huh. uh, this is a triceratops rib uh -huh. that was extracted from near that site. Yes, and what, how are you sure that that is from that particular dinosaur? Mm -hmm. You know, talk to us That's about that. That's a great that. question. Yeah, because it looks like just a bark, almost like bark, uh, well, a dead tree or something. Right. Well, it's, uh, at the end is a process that is a little eroded, but that would be slightly longer mm -hmm. and slightly more rectangular, and that's where it would insert into the spine. So the, that's, 
uh, how the appearance of Triceratops ribs is pretty established. Mm -hmm. The length and the thickness, uh, also a really good indicator that it's, it's a large herbivore. Uh, and there, the diversity at the end of the Cretaceous was quite limited. There weren't that many dinosaur species. Mm -hmm. They were already un undergoing biodiversity loss. So there was a limited number of species to choose from. Okay. So when we see a rib that size, it's a safe assumption that it's a triceratops. Okay, have you found any other fossils from different dinosaurs? Or? Yes. Yeah. This year, and this is a rare find, we found a triceratops, uh, sorry, a T-Rex tooth. Oh, wow. And a 98% complete tooth that my partner, uh, he found it the week before we got there. And how do you know it's from that particular dinosaur and a dinosaur, you know, yeah. It, that that is the, the dominant apex predator for the late Cretaceous. Uh, there were no other predators of that size at that time. Uh -huh. So anything with massive teeth uh, like that, it's, it's, it can only come from, from one critter. Which is the T-Rex. Which is the T-Rex. Uh -huh. And we actually, just down in the same draw from it, we were excavating a soft-shell turtle, a late Cretaceous soft-shell turtle, that obviously had signs of predation on it. Mm -hmm. And we thought that might have been a T-Rex, but when we, the preparator finished his job and removed the sandstone from underneath it after we got it into his hands, after a three and a half hour event the last day of this, this year's expedition, we saw that it wasn't a, a T-Rex bite, it was a bunch of crocodilian bites. Mm -hmm. So it was a late Cretaceous ancestor to crocodiles or dinosaurs mm -hmm. that had preyed on it. All of this has been done through the, the LEAP lab Yes, this, okay. is a, this is a LEAP Lab expedition. We are currently working with uh, Indian River State College on mm -hmm. uh, getting uh, expeditions established for IRSC students uh, to take them out at hopefully no cost mm. uh, and get them that experience. Mm -hmm. uh, that experience is open to other folks who want to pay. There's a fee. Mm -hmm. uh, it's typically $800 to attend these camps mm -hmm. plus your travel expenses. Mm -hmm. But it is amazing. You won't hunt for we do scout for fossils, that's part of the activities, but we left three active dig sites this time. We left a triceratops horn about this big that's almost completely intact. Wow. And their skull um, I, fragments I know your around. schedule is extremely busy, but would you be open to going into maybe some of the science classes or, you know, and well, that is very much sharing what we like some to of do. what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you some fun questions okay. now. Uh, one of the, our fun questions is, what is your favorite type of music? I'm still a classic rock guy. Okay. All I right. have not, my, my musical tastes have not evolved much past the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Okay. But mostly it's like late 60s to about 82, 84. Okay, okay. And also, um, books. What is your favorite book or uh, favorite two books? Yeah. Uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Why? Jared Diamond. Uh, it really is a thought-provoking look at uh, uh, things that have influenced the, tra the trajectory of human uh, society uh, and a lot of unintended consequences. Um, a couple of other books uh, I've, I've read, I'm struggling to recall the authors, but there were two uh, really fantastic uh, history books, historical accounts of major World War II battles that determine the fate of mankind. Mm. I don't think that's understating it. Mm -hmm. uh, one is uh, Antony Beevor's Stalingrad, which is a, the biggest battle of World War II, the biggest land battle. It's a gruesome, horrible story. It, it, it's, it, it ends up being kind of an anti-war book because it, it's, it's so nihilistic and terrible. So much that went on. Yes, and it, it was all for it was driven by the egos of the two dictators on each side of the conflict. Mm -hmm. It was an unnecessary battle uh, at the end. Of the, from, from a geographic standpoint, there was no reason to fight it. No, and so many wars, there's no reason to fight, but it's right. because of man's ego and man's dictatorship. And they ended know, up dictatorship. all resources that they could to that struggle. Mm -hmm. And that had a huge impact on uh, the direction of land warfare in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there's another terrific book out there on Midway the great naval battle that uh, allowed the U.S. Navy to push the Japanese back from the, the vicinity of Hawaii mm -hmm. and uh, allowed for the U.S. to take the offensive in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great 
hour by hour account of that pivotal battle. This has been a great interview with you. I mean, you know, we know each other from out in the community, mm -hmm. but I did not know the in depth of your life and, and <clears throat> what your studies and um, who you are, you know, on this level. So that's why I love doing well, the you. Speakers Bureau. We get, to, we get to be able to find out the great people that we have in this community well, that's, that's doing flattering. great stuff. You know, and uh, and and thank, thank God. You know, I'm I'm spiritual. I am that too. we have the educators, as you have educated us today, uh, to teach us and to open up our, our horizons of what is out there. And that's why I love the science because it's it's a uh, without science we would be in a whole nother state right now. You know, the discoveries and the research. God gave us an intellect that. for a reason. Yes, he did. Yes, he and, did. Uh, yes, If he I did. could make a shameless pitch for Leap Lab's presentation. Okay, let's do that because you have a little time here. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, our big uh, presentation, our real introduction to the community will be uh, at the IRC main campus on uh, a week from today, Thursday, September 1st at 530 mm -hmm. in the auditorium and N135. Uh, we're trying to get as many folks to attend as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, we will. My partner, Dr. Uh, Marcus Erickson, mm -hmm. will be there. Mm -hmm. Professor Robert Lowry, who's attended the digs, the paleo digs, a couple of times, uh, will be speaking as mm -hmm. well. Marcus is a terrific speaker. I think uh, everyone who attends will be entertained and informed. So this is this Thursday coming up. A week today, from today. today is Thursday. A week yeah. from today yeah. at 5:30. September in the evening, yep. IRSC in Fort Pierce or Port St. Lucie? Main campus, Fort Main Pierce, campus science Fort, building. In mm -hmm. the science building. Other end of the building from the planetarium. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And you guys will be talking more in depth All about, about Leap, Leap Lab. Lab. And uh, Marcus will talk about his five gyres experiences, which are extensive. Mm -hmm. he's, he's been very successful. Five gyres has gone to all the, the major oceanic gyres, mm -hmm. which is not an easy thing to do. They're not on the shipping channels. Mm -hmm. They're sailing expeditions. They're difficult. I would love <clears throat> to attend, but I'll be out of town. It's, but uh, that sounds just so exciting. It's, and it's I'm, interesting. I'm sure that there are uh, people uh, out here that's listening to us that is very interesting. Uh, just hearing you today and what you've shared with us builds up that interest and that curiosity to find out more. And of course, we have people that's in uh, similar uh, subjects and similar dealings mm -hmm. of, of research and so forth that I know would be interested in that. Well, we have expeditions that are upcoming. Uh, Marcus is lining up other sailing expeditions to the Bahamas, leaving from Florida. Mm -hmm. We're also, there's an upcoming expedition on the West Coast going up the California coast. Wow. So, Okay. <laughs> you've, been, you've been a lot of places. But if you could travel anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? I would go to the tropical Pacific. Uh, I've always wanted to. I would hit uh, the islands from uh, Tahiti and Papaete and go all the, all the way through the Solomons. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, that world, that part of the world, uh, from a salt water, for someone who likes to be in the salt water, it's a unique area, mm -hmm. and that area is being threatened uh, mm -hmm. with uh, environmental change mm -hmm. uh, uh, due to sea level rise uh, uh, more than most. Uh, I'd like to see it before it's altered irrevocably. Oh, wow, okay. If you had uh, your pick of any teacher in the school that you grew up in, uh, which one would you say made the most impact in your life? Um, I, I would have to go to a college professor on that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Richard Collins. Um, I had persevered. I, I was not a great student in high school. Really? Uh, I was a disinterested student oh. in, in high school. Okay. When I got to my upper level history courses and I found my niche, mm -hmm. um, he pushed people mm -hmm. and I uh, had the Socratic method of teaching. He mm -hmm. would call you out on the readings. Mm -hmm. But you found your niche, yep. which is and, very uh, important right. that to, to build interest Absolutely. to find your niche. Yes. And it, it ended up being a very confidence-building thing for me mm -hmm. to, to go. You know, this was, a, again, a, a pretty intense upper-level history course. 
in a, in a tough history program, mm -hmm. and he did not pull any punches, and I realized if I could get a hard A in his class, which I did, I could get a hard A in any other class I applied myself in. Mm -hmm. I think, that you was know, a pretty new thing for me. Just to <laughs> spend a little time on, on, on speaking about you finding your niche. Mm -hmm. In our public school, we have 56 or more programs in our career and technology technical and um, how important it is to have those programs because what we have found is that as children discover what's their niche mm -hmm. and what they're interested in they're able to get certifications we gave out over 2500 different state certifications in these programs and they have to graduate from high school to get their certification. Okay. So it really has helped build our high school um, graduation rates because kids are finding their niche mm -hmm. through these programs. Even if they end up doing something else in life, they're doing something they're enjoying of while course. they're yet in school. So that's a really important point that you made. You got it on the college level. I did. Because we didn't have what we have today. I didn't have a vote tech thing. Right. Really, right, that was active. Right, right. Had I had that, I was all about turning wrenches and working on cars. That's yeah, a, which a we have, we have that program teenager. too. Yeah. And some kids are really into that. In fact, I met one um, in high school, in the high school class, and I was asking the kids, what do you want to become when you grow up? And he says to me, a mechanic. I want to work on cars. We're going to need them. And so we have that. So that's in now what we didn't have then, and that's made a tremendous difference. Uh, you know, we're almost out of time right now, and uh, I have like a whole nother page of questions okay. that I can't get to <laughs> we you We can with. run through them if you want. But um, let me ask you this. Sure. This is the last question, okay. maybe. If you could, uh, if you were president, what would be the first thing you would do? <laughs> um, I, I would comprehensively, I would bring all stakeholders, all big stakeholders, industry, uh, regulatory stakeholders into a month-long conference uh, somewhere in the middle of the country and say, uh, we have to come, we have to choose a better path. Uh, we have to get re representatives from the ag industry. Uh, all these industries are terribly important for the economic well-being of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not necessarily on a sustainable path uh, and we need to address that. Uh, I'm going to introduce the concept of intergenerational equity. Mm -hmm. Every uh, generation owes it to the subsequent generation to pass on a world that is viable and healthy and strong in all ways. Mm -hmm. We're at risk of not doing that right now. Mm -hmm. So, do you, do you have a hero? Uh, I have a few. Okay, give me one. Uh, you know, it's going to sound corny, but George Washington had the most difficult job of any president. And to the decision he made at the end to walk away from the presidency when it was being suggested to him that he could stay in it the rest of his life hmm. was pivotal to not only American democracy, but global democracy. Everybody's flawed. Hmm. Every historical figure has, has demons and flaws. Hmm. He's no different. But to do that and to create the, the the army that won, that beat the, at that time, the biggest imperial force in the world, the British Imperial mm -hmm. Army, mm -hmm. through his experiences at Valley Forge, he, he's ahead above everybody else I in hear my you. book. I hear you. This has been wonderful. Your, your interview has been very um, informational, inspiring, Thank and you. motivating. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Reed, for coming and sharing your life story It was with a us. pleasure, and thank you for having me. You're welcome. Come back, I hope. Let's do that. Okay, good.